Okay, let's get started. So welcome everyone um, to our fourth webinar uh, of the SDG webinar series. My name is Sarah Switzer and I work at the Center for Community-Based Research. And in a moment, I'm going to ask my co-facilitators to introduce themselves. So this webinar is part four in a four-part series designed to build community-based evaluation capacity to advance the sustainable development goals. This is a partnered project between the Center for Community-Based Research and Conrad Grable University College, which are both located on the traditional territories of the Neutral, Nishnabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples, otherwise known as Waterloo, Ontario. And both CCBR and Conrad Grable University College are located on the University of Waterloo campus, which is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that include 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. Today, we'll be talking about the fourth phase of community-based evaluation uh, and focusing on the SDGs for local impact uh, by really talking about how we share uh, findings from evaluation projects. How do we share and how do we act on them? And I'm gonna pass it now over to my colleague, Paul Heiderbrett. Over to you, Paul. Hi, Sarah. My name is, uh, Sarah's noted, is Paul Heiderbrett and I work at Conrad Grable University College. Um, glad to be a part of this project with CCBR. So today, as we continue conversations about community-based evaluation and the sustainable development goals, we encourage us all to ask, sustainable for whom? In the spirit of reconciliation, we're committed to interrogating the relationship between the SDGs and the broader efforts of truth and reconciliation as outlined in the calls to action. We cannot talk about achieving the targets outlined in SDGs 16, four or five or any of the SDGs in a Canadian context without talking about reconciliation. I've learned much in this regard from my neighbors at St. Paul University College here on the campus of the University of Waterloo. In addition to being the home for the Waterloo Indigenous Student Centre, their greenhouse social impact incubator recently launched an Indigenous entrepreneurship training program open to Indigenous post-secondary students from across Canada this program is built around an Indigenous approach to business, to innovation and entrepreneurship. So given the national and possibly international reach of this webinar, we recognize that many of you may be calling in from different locations and different relationships to those places. Throughout today, we encourage you to make use of the chat box and join the dialogue by sharing different examples or contributions of work happening on the ground in your own communities. So before we get into the, the outline for our time together today in this, this fourth and final webinar, a few housekeeping details to go over one more time. This webinar is being recorded as you'll have noted. It will be posted online along with the previous webinars on the uh, this project's website. In theory, um, the recording should only show the active speaker. However, feel free to turn off your camera or change your name if you do not want this information captured. The chat will not be recorded or shared. However, if people share resources, we may, again, glean those and, and share them in other ways. Please keep your microphone muted. And finally, for tech questions, you can reach out to Madeline, who has her name or, um, yeah, has her name changed now in the participant list. Closed captioning is enabled and you can toggle it on or off using the three dots on the bottom of your screen. So um, you've heard from Sarah and you've heard from me. Let's hear from the rest uh, who are facilitating this, this webinar. I'll invite, invite my colleagues, maybe starting with you, Madeline, to introduce yourselves. And I'd encourage everyone to type into the chat, to tell us where you're calling in from and the organizations you're with. So Madeline. Hey everyone, I'm Madeline and I'm a student intern at the Center for Community-Based Research and I'm also a graduate student at Conrad Grable University College and I will pass it to Rich. Hi everyone, Rich Jansen here. I'm in the offices of uh, the Center for Community-Based Research at St. Paul's uh, University College just a few feet away from the Indigenous Entrepreneurship Program. Jean? Yeah. Thank you, Rich. Uh, I am Jean Dodier Basabose. Uh, I am a researcher at uh, the Center for Community Based Research. Thank you.
uh, here is uh, our aim for today's uh, webinar, which is the fourth webinar of the series and the last one. We are going to be focusing on acting on community uh, based evaluation findings. Uh, acting on findings plan includes uh, sharing community uh, based evaluation learnings uh, and initiating new actions. Uh, just to, to remind that next slide, uh, to, as a reminder, uh, uh, we always just uh, want to talk about why this project. As mentioned previously, this is a partnered project by Conrad Grebo University College and the Center for Community-Based Research. This project is funded by the Employment and Social Development in Canada. Uh, it, the project has been uh, an opportunity to engage stakeholders in reflective practices when working to eliminate violence and promote peaceful and equitable societies. It is an opportunity to build community-based evaluation capacity of organizations involved in advancing the SDGs with uh, a particular focus on peace, gender, equality, and education. The project is part of a bigger agenda, uh, which is about helping Canada achieve its agenda for achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030. Uh, this project says uh, we have been uh, focusing particularly on uh, SDGs 3, SDG 5, and 16. Um, yeah, I would invite my colleague Rich to also to help us refresh uh, our knowledge on evaluation. Thanks, John. In webinar one, we gave an overview of uh, community-based evaluation. I just wanted to um, remind ourselves of, of the hallmarks, the uh, the goals and, and um, the phases. So in terms of the hallmarks, what makes community evaluation community-based? Well, it strives to be as much as possible stakeholder-driven, participatory, involving those stakeholders, and thinking about the usefulness of the evaluation, so action-oriented. In terms of its goals, it has also three goals, and those three goals are that we try to, in the next slide, we'll see learning together, um, that we are doing research, um, and so we are gaining insights, but we're wanting to share what we've learned to audiences who can use that information um, in their decision making. And in the process all along, we are building relationships. And so we are facilitators when we're doing community-based evaluation. And concretely, in terms of the practice of community-based evaluation, we have four phases with non, uh, 11 non-linear steps. Um, here's our trusted GPS um, with those four phases laying the foundation and then evaluation planning implementing that plan by gathering data and analyzing that data. And the focus for today is acting on findings, making sure that we use the results and not only just do the evaluation. So that's the green that we'll focus on today, acting on findings. Yeah, thank you, Rich. Uh, as uh, you already mentioned, the today's webinar is uh, about is the fourth one and the last one, and uh, uh, to be uh, looking at the last uh, no, or the fourth uh, phase of community-based evaluation, which is uh, to act on findings. As mentioned, uh, Ari, it involves uh, sharing learnings and initiating new actions. Thanks, John, uh, and Rich for giving, giving us that uh, helpful overview. Uh, 
So in webinar two, this webinar build, series builds on each other, and, and we recognize that many of you have been coming to, to all the webinars, but some of you may also be coming for the first time. And so one of the things we talked about in webinar two, we talked about how um, we lay the foundation for really solid community-based evaluation um, project. And one of the ways that we do so um, is by making sure that stakeholders are engaged throughout the process, right? So engaging stakeholders is absolutely critical in community-based evaluation, really thinking about who is at the table. Um, and in community-based evaluation, often we rely on a steering committee or advisory committee or community advisory board committee. These are the guiders of our evaluation who provide guidance and feedback and input um, throughout all stages of the evaluation. So what this means is that by the time you're ready to share the final Findings, you already have a multi-stakeholder team that is well primed to act on the findings and to help you identify how and where to best share results for meaningful action. All right. And we can think about stakeholders in a few different ways. We can think about folks with lived experience, uh, influencers, folks that um, impact the lives of those who live with the issues, so program providers. We can think about sustainers, folks who have the power and resources to make lasting change. And we know, of course, that roles, these roles aren't necessarily discrete, right? People can have multiple identities. Um, but thinking really about the multiple stakeholders, so having different folks with different roles um, on your project from the very get-go so that we can ensure the findings get moved into action. All right, this is really, really key. Now, there are various ways you can involve stakeholders in your project. They might be involved as evaluation team members, as steering group members. Another word for steering group is community advisory board um, or um, uh, uh, community advisory board or advisory uh, committee. And um, as evaluation participants, we can also think about involving folks in different roles, right? So there might be consultation throughout a project. Uh, folks may provide feedback on preliminary analysis, or people may also impl um, implement the recommendations, right? And in more traditional evaluation, folks, sometimes participants are only involved in data collection efforts. In community-based evaluation, we really turn this on its head to really think about how you can bring findings back to participants. You can even involve participants in collaborative data analysis um, through recommendation generation. Or again, um, they might be co-presenting um, on different presentations or panels or whatnot to really move things into action. And the same is the case with a multi-stakeholder team and a multi-stakeholder steering committee as well. All right, and this is a bit of a high level overview, but we're happy to go into questions later. So in evaluation and research, you may hear the term knowledge mobilization. Um, we've got lots of experienced folks on the call today. I still see more folks coming in. Uh, other terms you might hear are knowledge translation and exchange, dissemination. Um, these are all terms for sharing findings. Um, now, what's important to remember is that really, this isn't a one-way process, that knowledge mobilization or knowledge translation and exchange should always be a dynamic, dynamic exchange, right? Um, a sharing and acting on findings. And while it's something that often happens at the end of a project, we really want to put the building blocks into place throughout the project to ensure that there is time and resources to share findings out in a good way, right? You know, throughout this session, we've been talking about how do we use community-based evaluation to localize the SDGs. This work starts with the work you're already doing on the ground. And in that, in that same vein, knowledge sharing also needs to circle back to the work you're doing on the ground. So some kind of tips and things to consider. It's important to be creative and engaging when sharing, understanding, and prioritizing action and relevance. We'll be giving some examples later. Evaluation findings should be communicated in ways that speak to various people, right? So we can think about folks internal to the evaluation or external to the evaluation. And a tip we can think here, again, going back to the steering committee, if you involve folks from the very beginning, including say policymakers or folks who are involved in leading that program change or leading some of um, uh, who, who are the audience members you want to reach, if they're involved from the very beginning, you're going to increase the likelihood that they're also going to share out the results. So that's why the steering committee is really key here. And finally, that the steering committee um, uh, agrees and informs all strategy used. So by involving stakeholders up front, as I mentioned, it's more likely the findings are widely shared and acted upon.
And we can think too, I know there's lots of folks in diff, uh, calling in from uh, different uh, locations, roles, projects and whatnot. And so the types of stakeholders you're gonna be involved or the locations or avenues where you're going to share is going to vary um, also depending on the SDG you're working on as well. Lastly, we can think, how might your project or organization contribute to Canada's 2030 agenda? And how might the SDGs themselves as a framework help you in communicating your findings to a larger audience? Right from the very beginning of the webinar series, we saw how so many um, folks that were in the audience were working simultaneously on multiple SDGs. So it can be a real uh, valuable framework for collaboration. So there are many different strategies for sharing results. Um, the strategy you use um, uh, in the end really ought to help you achieve your goals, right? Um, so this is really, really key to kind of think through. Um, why are you sharing your work? Who are you sharing your work with? And, and what are you trying to, to um, achieve in doing so? Because that can, that can help. Now I'm curious to hear from folks in the audience just by virtue of chat. Uh, looking at the, the information on the screen, um, we've got a few different options. We've got written options for sharing results, reports, articles, letters, bulletin boards. I mean, that was kind of pre-COVID <laughs> newsletters, news releases. Uh, we've got visual outputs, infographics, posters, videos, pictures, comics, and we've got oral outputs, presentations, community forums, conferences, theaters, storytelling, and more. So just a bit of a poll in the audience and type into chat, which strategies have you already used um, or might you, or maybe you're thinking of using in any upcoming evaluation for sharing results? Infographics, thank you. Yeah, we'll be talking about infographics shortly. Dashboards. Oh, I'm curious, Catherine, if you can say a little bit more about that in chat. What is that? What are dashboards? While you're waiting, let's see. The other folks are saying social media. Yeah, absolutely. Articles, videos, reports, quizzes. Yeah. Newsletters, social media posts. Social media is becoming a much more common way to share out findings. You know, some projects, what they'll do is they'll create short um, videos that are one to two minute videos that get posted that encapsulate findings that can be a great way to use social media. Co-producing uh, video and storytelling projects, absolutely. And I love the, the, the word co-produce there that Angela, you shared into chat because we can think about, again, this should be a dynamic process. So how do we collaboratively roll out these strategies? Great. More reports, more community forums. Thanks so much, everyone. That gives a, a bit of a sense of the strategies that you're using. So I'm going to um, move us through a few various strategies very, very quickly. Um, so we've got your, your uh, written narrative approach. This is probably the most common way um, in evaluation to share learnings. You know, folks are pretty familiar with it. Um, although sometimes it can be helpful to, to see what a report looks like, especially for those of you who might be new starting out with your evaluation. So you can um, see on the screen here, we've got a sample table of contents and what you might include in a narrative rep report, including introduction, program overview, the overview of the evaluation itself. So what, would, what was the approach that you took, um, but also what were the methods that you used? Um, what were your questions? What was that purpose statement? You know, Coming back to some of the conversations before and then mapping out and organizing the report um, around your, your findings. Uh, and importantly, also thinking about future directions um, and uh, any appendices that you might include. Many of you also identified uh, infographics. Uh, infographics are a fabulous way to share out findings and something that we at the Center for Community-Based Research have been doing a lot more of recently. Two of the infographics on the screen are from um, the Community-Based Research Canada. Uh, the Center for Community-Based Research uh, acts as a secretariat for CBR Canada. And I'll actually ask Madeline to pop into chat a link uh, to some of these infographics if you wanna take a look. Um, but they can be really short, um, ways to share findings um, uh, with folks. Uh, and they can be visual, um, as you see here on the screen. We've got uh, two infographics with lots of images and uh, diagrams, one connecting to uh, issues of um, uh, racial justice and education and COVID-19, and another one exploring issues of decolonization and youth housing. 
with Indigenous young people. So more examples of infographics that we've got here on the, the screen. Um, infographics can also be used to share quantitative data. Um, the two examples here are from the Women's HIV AIDS Initiative. So really looking at uh, examples of gender uh, equity. One of the benefits of using infographics or these summaries is not everyone has time to read a full length narrative report. So you might draft a narrative report um, for you know, a few key stakeholders that could be anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20, 30 pages, sometimes longer, but you know that you want to get your findings out to as many people as possible. And so these visual reports can be much more accessible and easier to, to read, and then folks can consult the longer report as necessary. Um, one of the other things that, um, can be uh, ways that these can be useful is you can work with your steering committee to develop them. Uh, and so you can do them collaboratively. Uh, and lastly, they don't have to be expensive. So both pictochart.com and Canva um, are great places to create infographics. Um, they offer free um, subscriptions. You can also pay uh, for kind of an upgraded subscription. And interestingly enough, some of them, I believe Canva offer, uh, offers free pro subscriptions to nonprofits um, in this country, which is kind of neat. And I see, I, I see the note in chat from, from Catherine. Thank you for letting us know a little bit more about what Dashboard is. Dashboard is in the information management tool used to track, analyze, and display key performance metric, performance indicators, metrics, and data points. That's great. So we can think too about how do we then include community members in the sharing of those, those strategies as well. So open forums are another strategy that we can use when sharing um, findings. Uh, an open forum can be a place to share findings, receive feedback, prioritize actions, and celebrate successes. Um, it can really be a space for folks in the community to attend and contribute their voice to a key issue. A lot of these um, forums used to take place in person, and now we're finding them, you know, we're, we're online, we're on Zoom. So there's some opportunities there around national dialogues that can happen. Right. And they can take all sorts of different forms and use different participatory strategies. And we can talk more about that during the Q&A period at the end if we have time. Um, so, for example, there are unconferences, world cafes. Get in touch if you want to learn more. And we're happy to share some more information. Um, and conferences, in short, are a strategy where it's like a, a conference, but the content isn't quite planned. And the folks who come to the table identify the topics that are going to be discussed. Right. And so some of those events can be really great places to share some of the work that you've been working on and to move it into action. Finally, we can use the arts or other creative or cultural production forums um, in sharing our, our findings. There are some methods like photo voice, which is a method where uh, participants take photos and then analyze those photos in and around an issue. Um, uh, and photo voice or participatory video or collaborative muraling or other arts-based evaluation strategies all have built-in dissemination opportunities provided, uh, sorry, built-in dissemination opportunities within them um, in the sense that folks are creating material that um, is really well-suited to being shared, provided, of course, folks um, consent. That's really, really key. Uh, we talked a little bit about that uh, in the last um, uh, webinar, uh, but there's lots of different strategies. Uh, some of the images on the screen um, include, there's some digital storytelling up on the top, um, uh, the, the top middle pane. We've got some collaborative muraling going on where folks were asked to um, draw images um, in a program evaluation to represent how uh, the impact that the program had on their lives. Um, uh, same with the, the image um, at the very bottom. Uh, it's cut off a little bit, but it's, it says fabulous forest, fabulous forestness of networks. If you can't uh, uh, see the image, there's a unicorn and a tree and a rainbow there. And then the, the other image on the screen is of uh, an installation that came out of a photo voice project. So lots of different creative opportunities there. That being said, you don't have to use art space evaluation to share work in art space ways. You can also translate data from other methods that might be more traditional, such as focus groups, interviews, or surveys into art space forms. Uh, so uh, at the top of the screen, we've got an image of graphic facilitation uh, by Drawing for Change uh, that was uh, done at CTU Expo 2017, a conference that we are involved with. Um, and with graphic facilitation, you have a graphic facilitator who draws out um, the conversation visually. Uh, and the other image on the screen is from a project that uh, translated findings from focus groups into images as a, 
um, as a source for conversation, and that was the Beyond the Toolkit project. Uh, and the illustrations there were by Andrea Vela Alacon. So lots of different options, op lots of different opportunities here. Okay, so that was a bit of a whirlwind of different options that you can use. Um, and there are so many more that we didn't even talk about. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, John, who's going to tell us a little bit about initiating new action. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, let me first of all just remind you that uh, the, one of the hallmarks of community-based research is uh, that it should be action-oriented. So the last step is to of the community-based evaluation is to initiate new action. The evaluation is not done until this step is done. This is uh, uh, why I like the community-based uh, research and community-based approach. Uh, this is the button passing step where the steering group and others in the organization take over the leadership of implementing the evaluation findings. It is a time to, to, to either improve or to take action that improve your program or action or just taking new actions to develop or developing new actions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, John. That's super helpful. And when we're thinking about the SDGs, one thing to, to add is that we're when we're at, moving towards policy change, um, there's often a level of kind of um, flexibility or, or adaptiveness that a project has to um, take. And so on the screen, you'll, you'll note it says be adaptive, take advantage of program or policy windows. This means sometimes having materials already prepared and on standby for when a news article comes out or when there's suddenly a shift um, in government or you know there's a window of opportunity. Uh, and then you're able to work with the materials you already have, like infographics, um, uh, executive summaries, reports, and whatnot, uh, and really kind of take action because you, you're, you're currently in the middle of a project that speaks um, to, to whatever issue is being talked about um, in that particular moment. Um, and so that's what that means there when we're talking about policy windows. And your steering committee here can be really, really instructive. Uh, you can remember earlier um, with the, the GPS that Rich shared, um, is it a circle, right? And so building a culture of evaluation is really key here um, as the evaluation will circle back. And it may lead to a new evaluation. So we're going to do a quick exercise on Miro. Uh, if folks are familiar with Miro, which is an online brainstorming app, we'd really love to hear from all of you because there's so much wisdom and experience in the audience already. We'd like to know what are some knowledge mobilization strategies that you could use to excite and engage your audiences. So building on the poll we did earlier, tell us more. We are always learning about um, different collaborative approaches uh, to, to knowledge uh, co-sharing. And then second, how might the SDGs help you in communicating your findings to a larger audience? Um, we're still pretty new in the SDG agenda in terms of the, the, the pathway there. And so this really is an opportunity for us to collectively learn together um, on how we can use the SDGs to, uh, for social change, essentially. So this is what's going to happen. Uh, in a moment, Madeline's going to pop a link into uh, the chat. The Miro looks like this if you've never um, experienced Miro before. Two things that are helpful to know if you're new Miro user, users um, is you will get taken away to a different platform. So you, you'll open this on your browser. Uh, you'll notice on the left hand side, there are uh, uh, there's a toolbar that's going to show up and there's a little sticky note. Um, and so you can grab a sticky from there. It's under the T uh, and you can drag the sticky over. Uh, this is kind of like the, the same as having two giant flip charts on the wall, right? One flip chart is green, one flip chart is orange. And Miro can zoom in or out. You can move around the page and you can do so with your mouse or you can do so with your arrows or the zoom button uh, down on the right hand corner. All right. So that's what it looks like in case you um, are new to, to Miro. So Madeline, I'll just get you to pop the link into chat for us. Fabulous. All right, so both of these questions are on the screen. This is what they look like again, in case you need access. Um, and if you can't access Miro, you can also type these into chat. 
All right, so I encourage folks to click over to Miro and start filling it out. As folks are filling out the, the um, Miro, I'm already seeing some new suggestions that we don't have on our slide deck. So we'll have to update our slide deck. I'm seeing podcasts. That's a terrific suggestion. Podcasts have, podcasts have really taken off, especially in the last two years. Um, they can be super low resource. Um, I know platforms like Anchor via Spotify, I, th I think they're, they're free actually to develop a podcast and there's so many resources online. That's a terrific uh, suggestion. making sure we're sharing stuff out in non-academic ways, using accessible um, languages, articles, interviews, op-eds. Yeah, absolutely. Live streams, YouTube, Twitch, Instagram. I work with a number of youth projects and they're using TikTok. Poetry. I see someone put on the co-creation of dissemination tools. Yeah. So how can we make sure that even in the dissemination, we're doing it collaboratively? Encouraging folks that you're working with to share the findings themselves. Absolutely. Some of the most, the, some of the, my favorite projects that I've had the pleasure of learning from and, and being involved with are projects where folks take the findings and, and they go out and they do their own thing with them, right? And there are presentations and workshops happening all over the place. Because again, if we include folks from the very, very beginning, it's going to be more likely that they have ownership over the project and feel confident and capable um, um, and uh, invested, most importantly, invested in sharing those findings. And that can be absolutely key. Give folks a few more minutes. Shared a few more strategies I see here, which are uh, terrific. Thinking about intergenerational dialogue. So that's, yeah, absolutely key, depending on the, I mean, always, but in particular, uh, depending on the, the SDG that you're working on um, and how do we scaffold things to ensure that intergenerational dialogue or involvement of children and elders and parents are, are, are there from the very beginning. Messaging from local radio shows. Hashtags on social media, yeah. So on Twitter, linking into larger dialogues and larger movements. And that can be a really you know, easy, quick way to ensure that your work is getting taken up within a larger dialogue, especially if we're thinking about the SDGs, right? Because we can tag the SDGs. These are great. And I encourage folks, again, I, I, I can't say this enough. If you've got examples of work you're sharing, drop them into chat, send us an email, let us know, because this work is real. like we're really all learning together here. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen and just show um, for folks that might not be able to access it. This is what we're the board we're looking at looks like. Not sure. Can someone give me a heads up it, or a thumbs up if, if we can see the uh, the mural? Am I sharing the mural? Fabulous. Okay, great. I'll just zoom in here just in case folks can't see it. So we've got um, a bunch of different options here. And then I'm going to scroll down. Let's take a look. This is so terrific. All right. So how you might uh, how might the SDGs help you communicate your findings to a broader audience, uh, focused information. Yeah, absolutely. Focusing around a particular SDGs. Um, universities and colleges are starting to use the SDGs. So you could get support from them. Yeah. So we can think they're not just about policy windows, but funding opportunities too, right? Funding calls come out, initiatives come out in terms of local university campus partnerships. And those can be great windows to take into account. Um, the SDGs, uh, let's see, uh, can link to a very um, recognizable framework. They can hold copies of reports um, uh, on shelves. So uh, yeah, we can think about larger libraries and database systems. Targets and indicators of the SDGs can help build a common narrative, can create a language for collaboration, increase credibility in the industry. Sure, 
You know, in, in academic research, we often talk a lot about rigor and sometimes community-based evaluation or community-based research may be seen as less rigorous. But if you flip that on your head, involving more stakeholders from the very beginning is actually a way to increase rigor and credibility, right? Because you're, you're saying these questions have been vetted by communities and we've had folks involved in all stages in development and design. These are terrific. Thanks, everyone. So I'm going to pass it over now to my colleague, Rich, who's going to bring us back to our GPS of the four phases of community-based evaluation. Over to you, Rich. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks for that mural exercise. I really like the colors that you, you chose that matches my shirt. Um, so yes, we did it. We went around the four-phase cycle of a community-based evaluation. Uh, we laid a good foundation. We talked about those um, important steps up front. Um, taking maybe not a lot of time, but certainly a lot of intentionality um, in understanding who the stakeholders are, what the context of our uh, uh, evaluation is, um, the assumptions that, that people hold, and the theory of change that is the guide for the evaluation. Maybe drawing on external theories as well, like the SDGs, but being um, grounded in the local theory of change, and then identifying a purpose statement and a purpose statement that not only says what we want to learn, but also what we want to do with those learnings. And recognizing that this is about engagement as well, not just technical um, research uh, activities, but we're negotiating amongst stakeholders. What's the goal of our, our, of our evaluation and what roles do we each play in this evaluation? Which leads to the second phase of planning. And this is where we think about what kind of questions flow from our purpose statement and then how do we answer those questions? What methods will we choose to answer the questions? Recognizing that it's best to use multiple methods, often mixed methods, quantitative and qualitative, and consider multiple stakeholder perspectives. And then thinking about what are we gonna do with all that data um, and making a data analysis plan. And here we're negotiating perspectives. It's a conversation about what to privilege, how we understand um, the voices that uh, we want to hear from, which leads to implementing those plans, considering ethics. We talked quite a bit about ethics in phase three, even though we recognize that like engagement, ethics happens throughout all four phases, but traditionally it's been more um, uh, uh, highlighted more often in, in phase three. And then after collecting the information, um, perhaps we have to do a little bit of adjustment um, that that feedback looped back to phase two and do some more planning. Maybe we need some more um, data. Maybe we had a pandemic and we had to shift the way that we thought we were going to collect the, the data. And then we do the analysis. First by method and then across methods and to summarize it um, across stakeholder perspectives. And then of course today we talked about acting on the findings, sharing those learnings and then also initiating new actions, being the mobilization, the catalyst for um, people and knowledge um, to be activated. And that leaves us at the end of one cycle. And then comes the, the happy arrow of from phase four back to phase one, where you can think of cycles of reflective practice. So you can keep on going around this um, four phases in continual evaluation. Perhaps some cycles you have larger, some cycles you have smaller. Maybe you have a core evaluation, core methods that you use across all your cycles. And then every year you're adding one or two um, methods or maybe um, different aspects of your program, maybe different parts of your logic model that you want to interrogate, go for a deeper dive in some aspect of your program. And so there you have it, the four phases, 11 nonlinear steps of community-based evaluation. So um, just wanted to, as we're, as we're moving into the conclusion of this webinar, remind um, you all that this project and its uh, um, outputs, including this webinar series, um, are recorded and available online. In addition to that, um, 
we want to make sure that that um, we highlight the fact that those webinars will be accessible in an ongoing way through our our website that's been developed for this project. Um, you can again watch or listen to the recorded webinars. You can download the slide decks. Um, all of this this final and fourth webinar will be available in, in the coming days to, to complement the the first three that are already available. In addition, you can download and complete a community-based evaluation workbook. So that's an ongoing resource or tool that can be used to kind of walk you through this, this GPS in a step-by-step -step fashion in your own context and for your own, your own purposes. Um, so again, this is intended to be uh, an ongoing, not just a legacy, but something that we hope to continue to enliven in, in the future, um, there's a resources, a companion resources section of this website that includes um, all kinds of, of, of things we've been coming across that we've been gleaning and that we've been adding to, frankly, as we've been learning throughout this webinar series from, from you and others who've been participating. And so we, um, again, hope that this is a springboard, not a culmination of further work in, in seeking to find meaningful ways of localizing the SDGs. And in that spirit, we wanted to take a couple of minutes before we conclude to, to prompt some more reflection on, on your part um, as we're thinking about next steps, where we go from, from these webinars and, uh, and from the resources we've already gathered, from the workbook that's already in place. Um, we would really relish your help in helping us envision further next steps. And one way of doing that is inviting you to, to take a moment to reflect on what would help you take further action on localizing the SDGs through a community-based evaluation approach um, based on what you've seen, heard, learned, relearned um, through this series. What would be most useful to you um, in your context? And so, yeah, take, take a moment to reflect on that. Um, I think all of us on this team are, are doing the same thing as we, as we get to this point in the project. And, um, but, but we're eager to hear um, very concrete and specific thoughts that you might have, again, to inform, inform our own thinking going forward. So take a moment to think about it. I'll stop talking. And then add these, uh, add your thoughts to the chat, please. Thanks, Irina. Um, a library of tools, frameworks, resources. Um, and so, and again, I think uh, we encourage you to check out the website and the supplemental resources section of the, of the website to see. Uh, we can't claim that it's a comprehensive library, but um, as, as many of you will know, there are no shortage of resources being put out around the sustainable development goals, um, some targeted at different audiences. And we've, we've again, tried to, to capture the, the pieces that we've found particularly helpful or others who've been participating in this series have found particularly helpful, um, but it's not a closed set. So we're always um, <clears throat> eager to add to it. Joanne, yeah, the opportunity for, and well, a number of people noting this, opportunities for networking, partnerships, connecting and learning alongside others. Um, so these webinars are kind of the, the second phase of the project. We, we had a workshop series in the, earlier um, where there was more interaction and, and, and connection within um, organizations based in Waterloo Region or a little closer to home. Um, but I think we definitely learned from that that there's a lot of value in, in sharing learning and walking alongside others who might be asking similar questions. Um, so you're not inventing the wheel 
And there's some great examples. And again, the resources section of the website, I think highlights this of, of communities that are, are collaborating in more structured and intentional ways. And, and maybe your community can take some inspiration from that or your sector. Paul, can I add something to that? For sure, yeah, jump in soon. Thanks, I'm looking up through the participant list. I don't think Laura's on, Laura or Jorge are on the, the call today. Uh, they've joined us in other, other weeks, but for folks who aren't familiar, uh, Tamarack has a really fabulous community of practice um, that's specifically designed for folks working on the SDGs to network and collaborate. Uh, it's uh, a monthly community of practice. It's on a, a Tuesday in the, the afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from, might be the morning, um, but uh, really, really great place to connect with. And so if you're interested, send us an email if you're not already connected and we can put you in touch with them. Uh, and I think they're running the community practice for the next three years. So uh, lots of opportunities, maybe for some international growth there, because they're really invested in making sure that the community practice informs what they do next. Yeah, if I can just jump jump in in response, uh, one, one um comment was that a database of more academic projects and people working on SDGs, and this is something that I think has come up a couple of times in, in the course of this project, and, and, and as we mentioned today, I think already too, that there is a lot of interest in the context of uh, universities in Canada, well, and, and, and beyond, uh, just to acknowledge that too, this isn't just germane to Canada, um, but increasingly um, some interesting efforts at aligning research and, and, and creating opportunities for interdisciplinary collaboration to target particular SDGs. And depending on which community you're in, um, you might find a very like eager um, university partner. Um, and, and by that, I mean, uh, uh, again, using researchers using the SDGs as a lens to find meaningful community partners um, to inform their, their understanding and their knowledge about, about issues related to a particular SDG. And so one, one quick and easy thing to do is in your city or community is to, to, to check out or contact your, your local university um, or, or college, in fact, um, to see what's going on. And it depends where, where you're at. Um, some are actually getting very ambitious in terms of aligning and structuring and using the SDGs as a gateway into their research community. And so that, that's a, uh, an easy way of exploring partnerships. Um, and excited to, I'm excited to see how that might might deepen in the in the coming years. Paul, can I add something to uh, for sure? Comment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I see Sarah um, put in the comment, and uh, by the way, hi Sarah, good to connect with you again. Um, getting a pulse on how many organizations are actually addressing SDGs, um, and I, I love that. Um, comments because I, I don't think we really know. I think we're in Canada anyway, um, at the beginnings of using SDGs as a framework for our civil society. Um, we have had a lot of other frameworks that tend to be more funder driven fr frameworks as opposed to this kind of meta framework, right? Um, and so I, I like that idea as, as a community-based research project that also encourages localization of SDGs and community-based evaluation. So. Um, yeah, so let's keep that in mind and maybe that's a, a future project. Yeah, so some, I think some great comments. Um, good to see the, the energy and the interest. Um, And the potential, I think, just underscore. I think one of the things we've been learning, and one of the things I, I would really affirm is that that um, uh, you know the potential for some new kinds of relationships, uh, even just in the course of exploring who might be using the SDGs in your community or in your sector. Um, um, I think they can be an interesting mechanism for collaboration and partnership that may take you in all kinds of unexpected directions as a result too that are far beyond simply how are we assessing our impact in relation to a particular SDG. Thanks so much, Paul. And thank you to all of you for, for sharing in the, in the chat, like what a, I'm, I'm just always, I learn so much in every single one of these webinars um, from all of you in terms of the work that you're doing. And, and this work is really like, we're kind of at the beginning, you know, as Rich alluded to, you know, we don't quite have a sense of, 
who's working on the SDGs and what is happening at kind of at the organizational level. And so it's been really critical to have your voices in the audience um, uh, as we kind of make, make sense of, of, of this framework together and what it means to localize. So thank you so much. So just to encourage folks to, to stay in touch, send us your resources on our website. This is a one-year project and our project is, is sadly coming to, coming to an end um, this May. Um, uh, but um, we hope that the website will um, be a kind of a lasting resource for folks. And, um, and uh, this conversation today has helped us to think a little bit about next steps. You know, if we think about that wheel again, right? Uh, uh, a project may conclude, but then it, then it starts with, with um, there, there's a new iteration and there's a new energy building on the movement and the momentum. Uh, so we'll, so stay in touch and, and, and we will stay in touch with all of you. Uh, here's our contact information. Um, you can reach out to us at general at communitybasedresearch.ca or cpa.communications at waterloo.ca. Um, uh, as I, we mentioned earlier, uh, we're, we're, we're two organizations, uh, uh, the Center for Community-Based Research as well as Conrad Grable University College uh, and Paul here via the Kindred Center. Kindred Credit Union Center for Peace Advancement, uh, and can tell you lots more about the Grable Peace Incubator as well. And I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague, Jean, um, for the last word uh, and to share a little bit about a survey that we've been working on to, to hear from all of you about what worked or what didn't work in terms of this webinar series. Over to you, Jean. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, as we are coming to the end of uh, the webinar series, uh, we would like to thank you all for your active participation and please complete a short feedback survey uh, following uh, today's webinar because we want to hear from you from your feedback uh, and uh, we will end a few minutes uh, early to give you time to complete it yeah thank you so much and um, yeah have a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful weekend. Uh, Madeleine, please uh, could you send uh, uh, the link, the survey, the survey mark link to, to the participants so that we can collect the feedback. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I'm gonna stop the recording now uh, in case folks wanna say goodbye, but to all those that are listening uh, after the fact, thank you so much for tuning in.